I'm back in black, YouTube. It's been too long. There's some new music out in the world, and I think it's worth talking about. So, let's get to yapping. The band is Foo Fighters, and the album is Concrete and Gold. This is the ninth studio album by the Foos. God, nine albums. It's horrifying that there's some families out there with more kids than the Foos have albums. Earth is populated, people, okay? We're good. We really, we're good. You can stop pumping out babies like it's confetti, because you know you're only gonna do a good job on like three of them. The rest are gonna be a bunch of children of the corn, a bunch of Hannibal Lecters running around, but I digress. The album, the kickoff. This song fills as both a doll-like intro to a for the most part loud ass album and a little tease of what's to come, lyrically and tonally. It's basically the extremes of the album concentrated into one song in terms of dynamic range. We get a whispery lullaby level Dave Grohl singing to us and then kapow! Loud ass release of choir, guitar, slow booming drums. So loud, in fact, that I think the mixer may have up. What? Oh, we're going to Applebee's? Oh, Yo, sweet. It's just a little too loud. It's just, I love, you know, that kind of dynamic in a song. I'm a big fan of explosive surprise release things, but, but this felt like it was just, just a, it just crossed the edge between like a loud, awesome, that was epic moment and like that hurt my ear. I'm so serious. I hope nobody listens to this album for the first time on the highway. Run, the first single and reportedly first written song for Concrete and Gold. A long time ago in a stage far, far away, Dave Grohl broke his leg during a concert in Sweden. After that, he proved he is the Chuck Norris of band frontmen by not only finishing the show, but having an insane throne slash shrine to rock and roll built for him on which he played out the rest of the tour. It's amazing. The only way that could have been more badass is if he had built the throne out of the bones of one hit wonders. Anyway, he's there with a broken leg, going through a rough recovery during the band's hiatus, and along comes this song to break the silence. The Foos always have their punching the teeth kick in the rib single that just tears your head off, and that's what Run is. It's massive, it's heavy, and it's reggaeton. With that beat and the little remix, the Foos could have all of South Florida behind them. <laughs> Everyone just <laughs> If only they had Pitbull doing a featured vocal. Please never have Pitbull do a featured vocal. I beg you. Make It Right. Got some Black Betty vibes on this song. It's also very Led Zepp. Make It Right is a surprise in tone and stylistic choice. It's raw, gritty, bare bones rock and roll. It feels busy and very minimalist at the same time in that there's not a whole lot of instruments in the song, but the drums are doing a lot to fill up the space. Most of the song feels like a three-piece band is playing, which makes me wonder how they're gonna go about playing this one live. I seriously doubt they're gonna leave this off the set list for the foreseeable future, so this might be a water break song for half the band. <laughs> the Sky is a Neighborhood. What exactly is this song about? I don't know. Aliens? Nuclear war? Our atomic connection to all matter in the universe? Maybe it's just about how annoying it is to live in an apartment complex. Steve, I swear to God, you don't stop stomping, I'm coming up there with a bat! Bring it, loser! <laughs> And I'll tell you what, the song and its video made me really happy. The band's name is UFO related, so seeing the Foos make a song slash video with that blatant sci-fi element to it feels very full circle. Also just makes me happy to know that Dave believes in UFOs. You hear that, Mulder? We're not alone. Nice. Lyrically, the song is somewhat obscure. There's that heavy sci-fi element, but there's also a chance that the sci-fi phrasing could be a metaphor for bombs falling on houses as well. The reason I'm thinking this is that Senor Grohl has mentioned in interviews that the current state of American politics has soured him a bit and that disillusion has seeped into his lyrics. So it could be very likely that Dave's using the fun sci-fi theme as a vehicle to deliver his more down-to-earth fears of what's to come for mankind via the current U.S. administration. Away from the lyrics, this is the first song that drew my attention to the technical production of the album. That's something I'll talk more about later, but it opens up with this odd distorted bass drum and a vocal that sounds like you're in the room with Dave Grohl as he sings to you from across the studio. Not gonna lie, at first, I did not like that combo, but once the chorus kicks in and granted after hearing it like 20 times, it grows on you. Who knew? One more interesting thing is Dave's vocal delivery on the song's title lyric. The way he delivers the word neighborhood, specifically the hood portion, feels a little oddly placed to me. You know, there, there are other ways he could have delivered that lyric that probably would have been more mainstream catchy. You know, there's ways to land melodies that just kind of hook you better. But the man's written music for over 20 years, so he knows what he's doing. And uh, I'm sure he did that choice on purpose, which is what makes it interesting to me. La di da, loud, fun, kind of funky, start, stop, punk rock. The verses feel like the foos are itching to blast off, but they're pushing up against this huge, heavy barrier. Or like when you try to start a piece of shit car, and you're just like, 
That's the feeling of the beginning. It's a slow, spacious march with what sounds like futuristic moog keys that explodes in the chorus. The song kicks off with Grohl screaming, look out because I know what you're doing. Turn up the American ruse. White House, Death in June, Jim Jones painting in a blue bedroom. So safe to say, he's not looking too fondly at the current state of American democracy. Or large chunks of the American public either, for that matter. The song seems to vaguely touch on different aspects of public perception. A misleading government, masses of people with tunnel vision, religious fanatics, and I would say that most of the song is about the latter. And I found that final keep your pretty crosses to yourself lyric very interesting, because Dave often wears a cross during shows, so I wonder if there's an internal crisis of faith going on there. Or if it's just Dave going, listen, I wear the cross thing, I believe in God, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same God. Judging by how you guys are getting a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over there with the murder and the torches. This ain't the Royal Rumble, people. Okay, we can all get along if we just chill the f*** out. Just because I like Lord of the Rings doesn't mean I gotta fight you because you like Harry Potter. That being said, I will and don't push me. Dirty Water. Love the song. I love it. I love the dynamics. I love the evolution of the song from beginning to end. It's just a great song. Simultaneously silky smooth and rough. Sparkly, flange guitar, and a crunchy blend of distorted riffs and synth from the band's newest official member, Rami Jaffe. The last time Dave sings You're the Morning After All My Storms, there may be better ways to have a musical climax, but I can't think of any. That's, it's, it's, it's too good. Dirty Water is filled with tonal variety, and though Quiet to Loud is something the Foos have always done, I think we have their sixth album, Echo, Silence, Patience, and Grace, to thank for the existence of Dirty Water. And actually for a lot of Concrete and Gold. The blend of clean and distortion, stripped down and explosive, that a lot of Echoes went for feels like it's been perfected in this record, where that technique has been used. And that's not to say that Echoes should be looked at as a rough draft album by any means. That thing has a whole mess of tasty within its tracks. And Home still makes me cry like a housewife on her fifth glass of wine. Or like me, whenever I see the end of VT. Ouch. Arrows. An unusual drum beat from the Foos on this one. Arrows is a song that I was unsure about at first. Again, the vocals in the chorus have this kind of loose delivery that doesn't usually lend to what makes a lot of modern vocals catchy. But by God, when it hits that fire away lyric, it clicks it all together. It's so good. And I wonder, assuming the song is actually about a real person, who is it? Who can it be? Can it be Courtney Love? Again? I don't... I doubt it. All the political mojo behind the album made me think it could have been about Hillary Clinton, but the Gemini lyric slash the pregnancy lyric ruined that theory. Ooh, maybe he's starting a beef with T. Swift. Step aside, John Mayer. There's a new man in town. Happily ever after, zero hour. The token relaxing song of the record. No surprise, oh shit moment like t-shirt. Just a very smooth, relaxing, sit down on your porch with a fine glass of Chardonnay kind of tune. I should probably make it known. I don't actually know what Chardonnay is, but here we are. This is surprisingly the funniest song on the record because it sounds beautiful and gentle, but apparently the lyrics are about silenced scientists resigning from the Trump administration and awaiting the end of the world in bunkers. Just watching that doomsday clock tick down. Oh snap, Taylor Hawkins is back on the mic, people. Yes, indeed, back and expanding on his career as the weatherman of rock and roll with Sunday Rain. Sunday Rain, that's right, we thought we'd seen it all when he gave us a cold day in the sun. Now he's cold as shit and getting rained on. I don't know who this character is that he's singing as, but things are not getting better for that guy. I hope he finds shelter soon. Sunday Rain is definitely a highlight on the record. Uh, the verses are very 70s, very Shaft, and the chorus is very White Album Beatles in terms of its riffing and in terms of its drumming, which is played by none other than Sir Paul McCartney himself. This song is a cool example of the differences you can hear between drumming styles. You immediately know it's not Grohl or Hawkins. That's, that's vintage Paul McCartney, baby. Which reminds me, Dave better call his lawyers, because the riff towards the end of Make It Right sounds a little live and let die. Just a, just... Listen, after what happened with Michael Jackson, Paul ain't playing around, Dave. I know he helped fix your leg, but you better believe he knows people who can break it again. Call Daniel Craig, have James Bond pay you a little visit in the middle of the night. What's up? Paul sends his regards. Say what? Oh, the line. Borrowing also happens on the line, both the vocal cadence of the verses in the line, as well as the lyric, Heart's Gone Cold, will remind a lot of us of Let It Die. I honestly don't mind that it happened as much as I am confused by how it managed to get on the record with a band of six dudes. 
Nobody realized this. I mean, I don't know. I suppose it's possible that Dave went, listen, guys, Let It Die was good, but it didn't really break through. Okay, so let's just give that material a second chance at popularity. To my memory, the Foos don't have many instances of accidental rehashing or rehashing at all. So, like I said, it doesn't bother me too much. If they did this a lot, if they were serial repeaters, I'd start making a fuss, but luckily that ain't the case, so. In a record that thematically can be considered rather bleak, the line offers the closest thing to joyful that we're gonna get. Uh, it is hopeful, but fleetingly so. What is the hopeful part? The tears in your eyes someday will dry. That's it. Literally every other lyric in the song is about being lost and searching, or about how basically this is our last shot at surviving the apocalypse, so chances are we will because if we don't, we're all dead. The lead up to the chorus reminds me of an earlier Foo vibe. I've seen people say that it reminds them of One by One, and I agree with that during the pre-chorus. I don't know if it's just the vocals or the vocal to music melodic combo, but something about it does send me into a late 90s, early 2000s vibe of the Foo's. We arrive at the title track. Dave has described it as being very Sabbath meets Pink Floyd, and I agree, but I would also describe it as February stars on roids. The most unusual part of the record, Dave says it sounds like a choir, and to me it does not, but that's a good thing, because that kind of obviously not organic choir, that weird, odd, synthetic choir made up of one man's voice combined with the type of compression and whatever other mixing magic they used created a really weird combo when placed within the band's music. And that weird combo gave the record a really standout moment. Had they used a regular choir, it still would have sounded good, but it wouldn't have been weird. And in art, as in life, weird is interesting. Weird is good. Unless you're like, Jeffrey Dahmer weird. The title track, like the opening track, is very small and, and subdued at the beginning, and uh, then explodes into this lush, crazy, <laughs> expansive thing, which makes it a very nice bookend for the album. It's also endearing to see that as deep as Dave has fallen into the rabbit hole of despair and cynicism, he makes sure to end the album easing us into a, a courageous sense of hope with his final lyrics. Our roots are stronger than you know. Up through the concrete they will grow. And then he ends the record with some guy screaming what sounds like, F you, Daryl! Or uh, like I needed another reason to love the Foos. They're just fun-loving dudes. It's weird, I've never thought the other Foo Fighters albums were anything less than well-made, but something about Concrete and Gold is hitting me like, oh wow, this, this is produced. And what I mean by that is that whatever Kirsten did, this album does feel different from the rest of the Foo discography and its production. It stands alone, it's, it's cohesive in a way that at the moment is striking me as being more advanced than the other records. And while I can't say any of the other Foo records don't sound like the songs on them belong together, in Concrete and Gold, this mashup of classic rock and modern rock and other weird things, it's, there's extra connective tissue in the details of the mix. There's musical flavors, specific tones and sounds from all the main instruments to the arrangements and even some of the effects that repeat in different songs, acting like a web that makes you feel like the tracks are different rooms within the same house. It doesn't make all the songs sound the same, but it draws them together. The way that uh, you notice someone is related to their dad because they had the same ears or eyes or whatever. This connective tissue stuff is obviously not lost on the band as Dave has mentioned that to him, the album is like Motorhead's version of Sgt. Pepper. And it's these connective elements, this, this connective tissue, that has led Concrete and Gold to that concept album-esque result that a lot of people will describe as sounding like a complete record. At first listen, I was a bit taken aback by just the level of production effects that this album is double dipped in. The first time I heard it, all my attention went there to the additionally processed distortion, the funhouse vocals. La Di Da was a big one that made me go, oh wow, this, this, there's a lot of decoration here. This whole thing is being messed with. And I got a little worried because I had heard who they hired to be the producer and kept thinking, uh oh, is this the worst case scenario coming true? <laughs> Are the foos being swallowed up behind the glitz of a pop producer's mixing habits? But my situation's a little tricky because my reaction was coming from the mindset of someone who's into writing and recording music, which I had been doing just before listening to the record, so I had to realize that my brain was in recording mode and therefore was by default paying more attention to the technical side of the record instead of the impact of the tunes. And it took a few listens to get past that, but when I finally shook it off and just 
listen to the record without thinking of the process, I began to really appreciate what the band and Kirsten were able to do, which is use modern mixing techniques and arrangement expertise to help an established band create an all-encompassing sound for this record. That to me at least was surprising and unusual. The same way that Daniel Lenoir and uh, Brian Eno did for U2's Octung Baby or Jerry Finn did for Blink's Untitled album. In the end, Concrete and Gold shows that the Foos aren't going to be a band that grows stale without a fight. Dave Grohl is set on keeping things interesting, both within the music and when it comes to his album-making process. And to their credit, the band is made up of a bunch of guys that are willing to take risks with him. Time and time again, the Foos show willingness to walk the fine line between expanding their horizons and keeping the fans happy. And sure, at this moment, they may not be showing the caution to the wind attitude that a band like U2 has shown with their stylistic shifts over the years, but they still have a long way to go. And hey, I would welcome another surprise shift in their sound, as long as it doesn't incorporate a guest verse by Pitbull. Please don't ever let that happen, Dave. Dear God in heaven, Tom Hanks be thy name. Protect us from that evil. That will be done. That's all for me. Tell me what you think, people. I want to hear all the comments and the thoughts and the opinions and the, all that. I'm all ears. Thanks for listening. And hasta la bye-bye. <laughs>